Hi, Joubert. Hello, Anan. Nice to see you. <laughs> Great to see you today. Uh, how are you? I'm doing fine. I'm doing fine. I'm uh, quite uh, happy to take part in this uh, series of uh, podcasts. I think you call them podcasts. Mm -hmm. And I'd like to thank uh, Maria for having uh, convinced me to be one of your guests. Yeah, it's a great honor. Uh, and I also thank Maria Batara. She was the very first guest. She's like the godmother of this project. And uh, it was very nice of her to be able to convince you to be part of the series. So today my guest is the one and only Joubert Laporte. Uh, he's Professor Emeritus at HEC Montreal, where he was a professor of OR and Canada Research Chair in Distribution Management until August 2020. He is now a professor at the School of Management at the University of Bath in the UK and professor at Molde University College in Norway. He is also honorary visiting professor at the University of Liverpool and distinguished professor at the Eindhoven University of Technology. Joubert is a member of CIGEL and founding member of Jihad. He has been editor of Transportation Science, CNOR and Infor. He has authored and co-authored more than 20 books and 600 scientific articles in combinatorial optimization, mostly in the areas of vehicle routing, location, districting, and timetabling. Joubert is a fellow of the Royal Society of Canada and an INFORMS fellow. He has received numerous awards and prizes, including, among others, the Order of Canada, the Glover Klingman Prize, the Euro Gold Medal, the Robert Herman Lifetime Achievement Award in Transportation Science, and several doctorate honoris causa. Joubert, thank you so much for accepting the invitation. It's, you know, such an honor. <laughs> it's a big pleasure. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so let's start. Uh, Joubert, where and when were you born? I was born in Montreal on the 15th of January, 1950. Uh -huh. Could you talk a bit about your family background? Yeah, I come from a very uh, ordinary family, I would say. My father was a school teacher. My mother was a secretary. I have uh, a sister and a brother who are professionals. And uh, there's nothing much to say about my, uh, my family. It's uh, as ordinary as you can think. Uh -huh. Is it true that your dad studied to be a teacher to avoid going to war, and that he became an artist later in his life. Well, that's it. Uh, when um, the war started in 1939, he was 19 years old. And then um, there was an offer from the government of Canada that if you studied to be a school teacher, because there was a shortage of school teachers, uh, you uh, didn't have to go to war. So he decided to become a school teacher. He was an artist, but he didn't uh, study to be an artist. He is a natural artist. Uh, he did some very good paintings and drawings, um, some of which are in, in our living room, for example. Mm -hmm. So, but um, th this thing about um, skipping uh, the war is uh, is quite true, and it had good effects. Uh huh. Yeah. Uh, it seems that you lost your mom at a very young age. Uh, you were about eight years old or so, right? Uh, I was eight years old, yes. How hard was it for you to grow up under those circumstances? And did that somehow shape your personality in the years that followed? It's uh, tough to measure exactly. Um, when you're eight years old and you lose your mother, I don't think you understand all the repercussions. Um, now that I look at it, with uh, a bit of insight, I think it may have shaped my personality to some extent, but it was not such a disaster in the sense that my, my father remarried and had uh, quite a reasonable life after. Uh, it's tough to tell exactly, you know, things happen to everyone in life and uh, I cannot say that more than that, I think. Mm -hmm. So your sister, uh was from your dad's first marriage and then your brother is from the second marriage, right? That's right. That's exactly it. Yes. Okay. Uh, were you a good student? Yes. <laughs> I've always been, I've always been a good student. Um, 
I don't know why, but um, in, in those days anyway, uh, you had to perform, you had to work hard. And if you perform well, you were rewarded. And I think that that shaped part of my life. You won um, prizes, medals for being a good student? Yes. Uh, there was a medal that you could get each month. If you were the number one in your class, they gave you a small medal that you could wear for a month. And if you were number two the month after, you lost the medal. So you try to keep the medal. And at the end of the year, they gave prizes, or they gave books to the best uh, pupil in mathematics and reading and writing and what have you. So you had little uh, premiums like that. Ah, so uh, is it safe to say that you definitely have a competitive nature? I think so. And uh, I was brought up that way. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you mentioned that you got books. Uh, did you enjoy reading books? I always liked books. Yes, and I uh, read books uh, from an early age. Uh, my mother read books for me, and then I uh, started reading uh, not uh, books of pictures, but real books, real books at the age of five, six or seven, I don't remember. And I've always liked books. I still read books. I always have a book I'm reading uh, whenever I go, when I travel, when I uh, wait for the bus when I am uh, have five minutes of spare, I read a book. Oh, do you have any favorite genres or authors? I like um, light reading. Uh, I like uh, detective novels. I like reading uh, John Grisham, for example. Mm -hmm. These days I'm reading um, Alexander McCall Smith. He's a Scottish author. Uh, not many people know him, but he's uh, highly prolific and uh, highly uh, intelligent and subtle in his writing. So when I have some time, I read books. Yeah, yeah. I myself read a couple of John Grisham books influenced by my father. Yeah, he writes yeah. really well, right? Yeah. Um, and uh, what about music? Music. Music is um, something I did not do uh, because I was not trained to do music. But I've got a good ear. I can uh, recognize notes and uh, with a bit of luck, I can uh, reproduce notes with my voice. Although my voice has uh, aged a little bit and I cannot do it as well as I could when I was a child. But uh, I've always been quite um, interested in music. And if I had to live again, maybe I'd be a musician. <laughs> so if I understood correctly, you have perfect pitch. That's what uh, people tell me. I think I may have lost it a little bit because uh, when you get older, you lose it a bit. But I would say so. Yes. Yeah, that's remarkable. I wish I had that ability. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so, uh, so Joubert, how was life in, in Montreal during the 50s and 60s all the way to the famous Expo 67, which my parents attended, by the way? Uh, I would I would. Um, split it into the, the two decades that you mentioned. Um, as I said, the 1950s were very conservative years, not just in Montreal, I think throughout the world. Uh, this was the time after the Second World War. Uh, there was a, a lot of reconstruction in the world, a lot of um, happiness, conservatism, I would say, and um, hope. And the 1960s, uh, uh, you, people talk about the 60s and the famous 60s, the happy 60s, and I think that's true. Um, there was a period of um, growth throughout the world, certainly in my country. Um, lots of um, things started. The people started building new cities and roads and bridges, and uh, they started uh, developing uh, education systems and hospitals at a large scale and so on and so forth. So there was a lot of uh, buoyancy in the world. And I would say that in Montreal, uh, that culminated in 1967 with Expo, where I work, by the way. And uh, I would say that thereafter, things went down slowly, 
and you can still feel the decline even today. I see. Yeah, my dad, he finished his PhD around 1971 and he was a postdoc there in Canada, in Waterloo, up to 1973. And he was struggling to find a job. It was a tough time indeed. He always uh, uh -huh. tells me about that. Uh, so Joubert, you have a BSc degree in mathematics. Uh, what motivated you to choose this degree? Okay, well, um, when I was at secondary school, I uh, developed um, a taste for mathematics, not just a taste, uh, a skill for mathematics. And um, I was doing what we call classical studies. Uh, that lasted eight years, by the way. And in these um, eight years, I learned a lot about the classics, the Latin classics, the French classics, and so on. So I've got quite a good um, a broad culture in those uh, areas. But also, we did mathematics, we did English, we did uh, geography and everything. And I was good at mathematics, and I really loved it. I would spend uh, evenings and the evenings and the weekends and uh, a lot of time playing with mathematical problems, and I enjoyed that. I enjoyed. It. I was good, and I enjoyed it. So after my um, classical studies, uh, the last two years of which, by the way, uh, were specialized in mathematics, I went to McGill to do a BSc in mathematics. And the BSc degree at that time was four years. But because of my previous studies, I was admitted in the third year. Wow. So I spent two years at McGill, only two years. Uh -huh. and, and so how was it uh, at McGill? McGill uh, is a fantastic school. They had top teachers, uh, top atmosphere. Uh, I learned a lot at McGill and I discovered at the same time that the type of mathematics you do at university, especially in the, the last two years of the BSc degree, uh, were not at all the type of mathematics I was doing at the secondary school. Um, it was a lot more abstract. Uh, it's one thing to do uh, trigonometry calculus, that's easy enough. It's quite mechanical and also quite inventive. I mean, to solve integrals, you have to uh, think a lot. Huh? But when you reach the more advanced courses, you do things like measure theory. And when you do probability and statistics, uh, you're not just counting uh, the ways to shuffle a deck of cards you know, anymore. You're doing convergence theorems and all that sort of stuff. And at some point, I thought that was very theoretical. And I didn't see myself doing that all my life. So I opted to do something more applied. Right. Uh, were you exposed to R at McGill or only later? Uh, I was exposed to linear programming mm -hmm. before going to McGill. Ah, how? So, so in my uh, classical studies, I was uh, exposed to linear programming. Mm -hmm. I knew about the transportation problem. I knew a bit about graphs and uh, networks. Uh, done some linear algebra, albeit at a very uh, basic level. So I knew about OR and I had read some books. So before I went to McGill, I had the, seen the book by uh, Saul Gass, for example. I knew about it. Uh, it wasn't an advanced book, but um, it kept me uh, interested in linear programming and so on. At McGill, we didn't do anything related to operations research, I would say. No, I did some um, actuarial science, mm -hmm. uh, probability statistics, but um, nothing we could really call operations research. Mm -hmm. uh, we are talking about 1970, 1971 or so? 1969 to 71. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Yeah. So what we did was the classical topics, um, analysis, uh, algebra, of course, probability, statistics, uh, number theory, mm -hmm. uh, advanced analysis, uh, differential equations, uh, differential geometry, 
That was tough, my friend. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> <laughs> but I didn't, I didn't enjoy all the subjects. I, I quite like some. I quite like uh, complex analysis, number theory, uh, actuarial science that I like. I didn't like algebra and measure theory. Uh, algebra, I found boring, you know, <laughs> categories and groups, and I, I didn't like it. Uh -huh. I could do it, but I didn't like it. Right. And, and why did you go to the UK for higher studies? Well, having decided to do something more applied and operations research in particular, because I didn't want to do um, economics or uh, applied uh, mathematics and physics. I wanted to do operations research. I knew about it. And then I applied to several universities in uh, Canada, the United States and England. I had heard about some of these universities from my professors, from uh, people uh, I met. And uh, I think I applied to five or six places. And I was uh, accepted in all of them. And then I had to choose. Everything, everywhere where I'd applied was in the United States and Canada, except England. And I was quite attracted to the idea of uh, going to Europe, of going to a place that was quite different from what I knew. And uh, there was a bit of mystique about England in my mind. So I said, OK, I go to England. And I knew about Lancaster. Uh, I had uh, received the documentation about Lancaster. One person in a company had recommended that I should go to Lancaster. He said, they're good at Lancaster. So I uh, said, OK, let's, uh, let's do it. Uh, I didn't have full information. I tell you, when you're uh, 21 years old, especially in 1971, uh, there was no Google, there was no web, there was nothing. So the only information you had was um, hearsay and little brochures that the university would send you by mail. And that looked quite fine. And I said, OK, I go to England, I go to Lancaster. Right. The Lancaster University has one of the oldest OR departments, right? In, in I the think they started, yes. They were among the first to start in England. Uh, if I'm correct, I think they started in 1964. At the same time as um, University of, uh, I think Sussex, I think. Uh -huh. Or maybe Surrey, but I think it's Sussex. And uh, Warwick, maybe. So in those years, they built several universities. And Lancaster was one of the first ones, and maybe the first one in England to have mm -hmm. an OR program. Yes, oh. you're right. Right. And so when I went there, they were only seven years old. Mm -hmm. Did you do any research at Lancaster University or only coursework? It's um, mostly coursework. Coursework. Um, case studies, I separate that from coursework because um, sometimes they give, they give you mega assignments, they give you a, a case to study, a 25 page case, and you were given two days to uh, solve it, to uh, find a solution. And um, there was a project, an applied project, which is not quite a master's thesis. It's an applied master's thesis. Uh, the beauty of it is that uh, it was limited in time. So you started doing it partially in January and full time starting in June. And at the end of August, it had to be finished. So it was a project with uh, a company, with uh, a government uh, department or something like this. You were supervised by a professor and you handed in uh, a report, a uh, 50 page report. Uh -huh. And that was it. OK. Uh, you met someone very special there, right? I uh, <laughs> met a very nice lady who became uh, my wife. Uh, she's still my wife, so we've been uh, we've known each other for 52 years now, and we've been married for 49 years. Wow! So it's been a, a, a luck in my life. Yeah. Uh, you later moved to London for your PhD. 
does Anne uh, have anything to do with that decision? Yes, yes, yes. Um, my my um, girlfriend, and she's called girlfriend because we are not married. Uh, she's called Anne, and um, she was doing the same master's degree as I was doing. That's how we knew each other. We we're sitting next to each other, and um, after her master's degree, she didn't want to do a PhD. She wanted to work in a company, and she looked everywhere in England, like most of the students in our class. Uh, I think I was the only one who did a PhD, by the way, uh, among uh, 30 people. And um, she uh, found a job in London. So I thought that uh, it, I should also go to London to be with her. And I investigated the possibilities of doing a PhD in London. So how did you choose uh, the London School of Economics? Oh, the, the school chose you. <laughs> well, uh, it's a mutual choice, I think. In London, in those days, uh, there were only two places I knew that did operations research. Maybe there were more, but I knew of two, and two very good places, by the way. One was Imperial College, and one was London School of Economics. And uh, we were in the summer, you know, in June, July, 71, about four months after the normal deadline for applications for PhDs. I don't exactly remember how I applied, but I must have written to the registrar's office because I knew nobody. And I would uh, write to uh, the director of studies or the, the, the direct, not director, but the, maybe the registrar. And I said, look, I'm interested in doing a PhD in your university. Uh, uh, is that possible? Could I uh, meet someone and so on? And I was interviewed by um, both places, Imperial College and London School of Economics. So twice I went to London. I went to Imperial College. I met a professor there, Ireland. Maybe you don't know Ireland, but uh, many I know. Well, uh, he's a famous author. You know about him. The, the, there's instances, right, uh, of on the CVP. Yeah. yeah. And so I met Ireland, and um, what he proposed to me did not really interest me. Uh, the, he was interested in. Um, machines and inventories and stuff like that. And uh, that did not appeal to me, to be honest. And uh, he implied there would be a lot of data collection in the thesis and that I would have to do uh, case studies and stuff. And um, I didn't quite like it. So I went to London School of Economics. After having received um, an invitation letter from Al Zalan, mm -hmm. And uh, everything was done by uh, writing in those days. I didn't have a phone. There was no internet, nothing. You had to write. You wrote a letter by hand, put it in an envelope, put a stamp, and waited for the answer. And uh, one day I received a letter signed A. Land. Not as a land, A. Dot land. And it said, uh, Dear Gilbert Laporte, uh, I'd be happy to meet you. Can you come and see me at my office at London School of Economics? So I went there and I was interviewed by her. And what she offered was something that I liked. She mentioned the possibility of doing something uh, a bit more combinatoric mm -hmm. as opposed to uh, industry related. And that applied to my, uh, my taste in those days and still today. I, I'm a, I'm not a machine guy. I'm not an industry guy. So we didn't specify the topic of the thesis at that time. But uh, she said, you can do that sort of thing. You can do some optimization, some integer programming, and uh, it will be about that. And I said, uh, yes, in spite of the fact that uh, they offered no scholarship, no office, nothing, no facilities for students. But I said, yes. <laughs> Wow. Uh, do you have any idea why Elsa Land contacted you? She said one day, I asked her, not, at the, not immediately, uh -huh. but uh, a couple of years after, I think, I once asked a question. I said, why did you accept me since 
I applied much later than the deadline. The deadline is in March and you apply in June or July. And she said, because you had the first at McGill, first class at McGill. So McGill helped me. I think McGill had a good reputation and still has a good reputation. And if you get out of McGill in mathematics with honors and first class, uh, that impresses some people. Absolutely, that's great. Uh, how was the working environment? I would separate the answer into two. Uh, working with Algernon was great because you uh, met her in her office quite frequently. Uh, she would see me maybe not once a week, but um, at most once every two weeks. She organized seminars uh, and she gave me a lot of uh, advice. She taught me things that were not in textbooks, that were not even published. She did not publish much herself and she um, knew lots of things that never went in print, but she would tell her students. So that was the best part, uh, working with such a nice and intelligent person. The bad part was the physical conditions. As I said, uh, I didn't have an office. Uh, it, everything was complicated. Borrowing books from the library took time. Uh, photocopying something was complicated. Uh, everything was messy. You didn't have a real office. You had to share a table in a, in a room. Uh, you couldn't put your stuff on the table when you left in the evening. You had to carry it with you home and that sort of stuff. So that was not so easy. And at the same time, um, housing in London was bad in those days. And I would say it's still bad today if you don't have a high budget. Uh -huh. So we lived in uh, things that they call um, bed sitters. So essentially you have a room with a little uh, cooker somewhere in the corner and uh, a sink, no bath, no shower, nothing. So you have to go to a common shower, to not, not even a shower, a bath, mm -hmm. to clean yourself. And everything was complicated. And for a while, I didn't even have a fridge. And uh, that's important because I had to finish my work day just in time to go and get some meat before they closed the stores, you know. Uh -huh. So at five o'clock, I had to go to get my meat. One day I decided to buy a fridge. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so it was a real adventure, not only at the universe, but, but yeah. Uh, outside yeah, it of the was universe. an adventure. Mm -hmm. um, in sometimes in the bad sense of the word. Yeah. And that prompted me to finish quickly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, fair enough. Uh, so how did you manage to survive financially speaking at that time? Because you mentioned they did not pay you. Now, they didn't pay me, but I had a small, small scholarship from the um, Quebec government. Uh, in those days, I think it was uh, around $2,000 or $2,500. I think it was $2,000 at the master's degree and $2,500 uh, at the PhD level. And it was uh, one year for the master's degree, three years for the PhD. Mm -hmm. uh, it was not a large amount of money. It was enough to pay my rent and to survive. So pay my rent, uh, buy some food, and take the tube every morning. Mm -hmm. And have a little bit more, but uh, there was, you couldn't save money or anything, and you didn't live rich. Yes, you yes. Count, count every penny, mm -hmm. right? <laughs> yeah. but still. Literally, uh, yeah. It was fine, I, I survived that. Yeah, so tell me about your PhD research work. Ah, uh, so, Around the beginning of my um, PhD degree, I uh, needed a topic. I don't think I could have found a topic by myself in those days. I didn't know enough. And uh, there was another student of Alzalan called Susan Powell, a bit more senior than me. And Susan said, um, there is this problem I've worked on. It's called the seriation problem. 
it's an ordering problem that you find in uh, archaeology and so on. And uh, it's a nice combinatorial problem. Maybe you could work on that for your PhD. And Azadlan said, yes, it's a good idea. And I uh, said, oh, yes, I'll do it, you know, because uh, <laughs> I do nothing else. So uh, the topic was proposed by Susan Powell, and I worked on it for my PhD. Mm -hmm. It was a tough, it's a tough problem, I tell you. Mm -hmm. But I learned many things by solving it. I learned a lot about integer programming and about graphs and uh, about multidimensional scaling and all kinds of techniques. So, you know, you take a topic and uh, you learn by yourself. You learn the tools that you need to solve the problem. And uh, there was no one to teach me about uh, heuristics uh, and so on and so forth. I had access to the, the code that Susan Powell and Azanan had written. It was called, uh, we called it the Lan Powell code. Uh -huh. And it was a solver for math programming that was uh, open to us, we could experiment with it, add things and do all kinds of things. Uh -huh. Very interesting. Uh, so is it true that you witnessed the birth of Prussian Cut in first hand, not necessarily with that name? I think so. I think so. Um, one day I was with Azanand in her office. And she told me the following. I almost remember the exact words. She said, there are two main ways to solve integer programs. One is branch and bound. Of course, she knew about that. She had written the, the first sure. branch and bound code. And even herself, she didn't call it branch and bound. It came after that mm -hmm. branch and bound thing. And she said, there's that and there's Gomory cuts. And as you know, Gomory cuts, uh, I wouldn't say it's a way to solve integer programs because it's very limited in uh, quality. But in those days, these were the two options. There was something else based on group theory, but uh, that never survived. And she said, wouldn't it be nice to combine the two ideas? That means introducing Gomery cuts within a branch and bound tree. And she said something else, not just Gomery cuts, but other types of constraints. So to me, introducing other constraints within a branch and bound setting, I call that branch and cut. Huh? She didn't use the word branch and cut. I think I heard about branch and cut maybe 10 years later, nine years later. Uh, it, I think the word branch and cut comes from the work of um, Grutschel and Padberg, mm -hmm. if I'm not wrong. Mm -hmm. And these researchers were also doing branch and cut at about the same time. But we were unaware of that. We did not know them. They did not know us. You have to realize that uh, communications were not as what they are today. Yeah, yeah. Uh, if you did not go to the same scientific meetings at the same time, you missed a lot. Mm -hmm. You missed a lot. These Today, uh, somebody does something and everybody knows about it the day after. Mm -hmm. But uh, I think she may be the inventor of Branch and Cut. I think she did it before Gretchen and Padberg, to be honest. Because the, their stuff was published in the late 1970s. Uh, she published things earlier. Mm -hmm. I did I did some work on that with my thesis in the early 1970s. That's remarkable. Uh, you mentioned uh, that you had access to, to her call, uh, the one that she developed alongside uh, Susan. Uh, so I wonder, uh, did you enjoy writing computer programs in the 70s? Well, uh, you know, I knew Fortran. <laughs> I knew Fortran and I knew only Fortran. And I still do today. <laughs> so, <laughs> I mean, I, I can read a code uh, in uh, any, any language, but uh, I could not code in uh, anything else on the Fortran. Fortran is still good. Paul yes. Dutt swears by Fortran. He still does. Yes, very, yes, very efficient. Yeah. But I wonder if you survived the punch cards era and, you know. Uh, yeah, yeah, I did. I mean, 
I'm not sure it's, whether it's related to the programming language or not, but it mm. was a technology anyway. Uh, you had to punch your cards and you had to um, give them to the computer center when you left in the morning, in the evening, or when you arrive in the morning. And sometimes you would receive a very nice uh, listing, very thick, meant that things were working. And sometimes you got just two pages. <laughs> it meant that you had forgotten a comma somewhere. So to survive this uh, kind of environment, uh, I needed to have several copies of my punch cards. And I ran several versions of my programs in parallel so that I wouldn't waste time between the runs. Uh -huh. So I would debug a uh, subroutine and work uh, on something else at the same time and so on and so forth. And there were no debugging tools. So you had to, if, if it didn't work, you had to go through every line of your code and run a test and see what happened at line 10, at line 11, at line 12, and print the output as often as you could. And then you would find, ah, that's where the mistake uh -huh. is. <laughs> and then you would go on. That's the technology of those days. Mm -hmm. And having access to papers in those days must have been a challenge, right? Yes, because uh, the papers were in um, journals, scientific uh -huh. journals. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. And at LSC, anyway, to have access to these journals, I had to go to the library in the morning and fill a little card blue card where it said I need a management science uh, volume uh, seven uh, and so on and so forth and I would give that to the librarian and she would tell me well come back at four o'clock this afternoon and it will be ready for you so I went back there it took time you know you had to get your coat on and off all the time and walk to the library it wasn't the main building and then you went back at four o'clock they gave you the book and you would look at the paper you wanted only to see that it was irrelevant. Mm. And you would return the book. And if it was relevant, you had to um, photocopy it. And there were photocopying machines and you had to put coins in the machine. And uh, it was two pence per page. Two pence to, well, two pence of those days was five cents. Uh, two pence is about uh, 3.5 cents these days. Uh -huh. Still, it's a large amount of money to photocopy one page, especially when you're a poor student. <laughs> but I did it. I did it. And that was the way you got the, the papers. Sometimes the papers and, uh, were not even available uh, there, right? Sometimes they were not available at the C. And they had a good system. They told you, well, it, we don't have it here, but you can go to this and that uh, university in London King's College or Queen's College or what have you, or Imperial College. And uh, you, so you took the bus, you had to register to the library, get a card and everything. And then you could get the book in the same way as you can get it at uh, LSC. And you could, uh, again, photocopy or not photocopy the paper. And uh, that's the way it worked. Uh -huh. So I spent a lot of time uh, traveling between universities and photocopying stuff. And I can tell you one thing, I read all the papers and every, pep every single paper that's quoted in my thesis, I uh, read completely. Yeah, fantastic. Uh, Contrary to what many people do today. Yeah. <laughs> so one may find uh, some of the OR papers published up to that point a bit strange. Uh, for example, the paper by Clark and Wright, the famous one describing the savings algorithm for, for VRP, is not very straightforward, right? Well, um, it was published in 1964, if I'm not wrong. Uh, I mean, the idea is straightforward. The idea is very simple, but the writing is not straightforward. Exactly, yeah. And I think that in those days, uh, in OR, we didn't have the vocabulary we have today. Uh, today, we talk about a graph about a set of vertices, about the set of arcs, the set of edges. Uh, you attribute uh, cost to the arcs and uh, demands to the uh, vertices and so on and so on. There's a nice vocabulary. In those days, the language was more fuzzy 
and things were described very often in words because there was a lack of mathematical notation. I think there's a bit of that. And that particular paper is um, very messy. Uh, it's based partly on um, combining two vehicle routes. The way it's done is that you combine the last customer of route one with the first customer of route two. But in that paper, they investigated five different ways of doing it. You could merge the two routes in the middle and that sort of stuff. It was complicated. And after 14 pages, I think, of development, they tell you at the very, very end, by the way, uh, we explain many ways to merge the routes, but the only one that works is where you merge the last customer of route one with the first customer of route two. And this is the way it's implemented anyway today. So I think this paper would not have been um, accepted or at least published today. They would have told the author, it's a nice idea, but please put it in four pages, uh -huh. not uh, 14. Huh? Yeah, the, the one introducing the two opt procedure for the TSP has also an interesting story. Ah, that's the paper by Crows. I think it's 1958, if I'm, yeah. if I'm not wrong, yeah. maybe 56, I think 58. Uh, it's a funny paper. If you read the first page, there's a footnote at the bottom of the page. And the editor says, uh, Mr. Crows sent us this paper uh, several months ago, uh, it was refereed. We sent him some comments, and then we could not find Mr. Crows anymore. He's disappeared. We believe he worked for an oil company in the Netherlands. So, since we could not find him, we implemented the changes ourselves. And furthermore, make a note that when he writes. AIJ, the I refers to the column and the J to the row. Today, that would not be accepted. Yeah. And the paper itself is full of uh, very big examples with uh, all kinds of marks and so It's an awful paper. Uh -huh. Again, uh, due to lack of uh, scientific vocabulary, I think. Yeah, know. yeah. So, Joubert, uh, you wrote hundreds of papers in your career. Why don't you tell me the story behind the very first one? Ah, the very first one uh, is applying dynamic programming to the seriation problem. Uh, while I was in London, one day I met one of my old professors from Lancaster, John Norman, he was called, and this guy um, liked dynamic programming. That was his main, his favorite technique. He loved, he loved to apply it to everything. And he said, I think we can apply it to the seriation problem. And we discussed that and uh, we did. So we discussed the, the, the uh, recursive equation, obviously, and I implemented the thing and that was published. It's a short, it's a short paper, it's a four page paper, I think, published in JAWS. And my second paper, was published in uh, the Journal of Archaeological Science as a sole author because the seriation problem had applications in archaeology, archaeological seriation, ordering of graves. And uh, after my thesis, uh, when I came back to Montreal, I wrote a short paper to compare two ways to measure the quality of a solution. And I uh, explained that one of these two ways gave results closer to what the real archaeologists did. Uh -huh. And that was published. Again, a, a short paper, maybe five, six pages. Uh, so my first two papers were about the seriation problem and something published in archaeology. Very nice. Uh, you concluded your PhD in 1975. Uh, was it easy for you to find a job after that? Yes, in a sense. Um, I didn't find a professor job immediately. I applied, uh, by the way, to, I think, 80, 80 places, including universities and companies. 
I did not really want to work for a company, but I thought, look, if I find nothing in a university and I find something interesting in a company, I may consider it. As it turns out, um, one person at the University of Montreal, Jean-Marc Rousseau, wrote to me and he said, look, we don't have a position for a professor, but I can take you as a um, research fellow. I think that's the best word in English. Uh, to make it simple, let's call it postdoc. Mm -hmm. It's the same thing. Mm -hmm. I can finance you as a postdoc. I think he offered me something for five years even. And um, I accepted. And all the other people, uh, all the other universities, I should say, had written back to me and said, look, uh, your CV is very interesting and so on, but um, we have no position right now. But you know what they say, we'll put your application in a file. And if anything happens, we'll contact you. And normally nothing happens, but one university a year after, I should say, mm -hmm. contacted me. They said, are you still interested? And I said, yes. So I started being at Ashussi in 1976. Wow. Uh, did you have any difficulties in publishing your first papers after the PhD? I would say yes. Um, when I was a postdoc at the University of Montreal, one of the things I wanted to do was to um, carve my thesis into papers like many people do. And uh, I started uh, doing that. I started writing papers using some main ideas in the thesis. And I submitted them. And I didn't know at that time how to write papers. This is something that Arzalan never taught me because she never wrote papers herself. And she was not the kind of person to jump on uh, her students' work to co-author papers. It was not, she was not a person like that. She didn't care about that. So I ne never had any teaching in writing papers. I did it myself. And um, I didn't do it the right way for many reasons. Uh, there are ways to write papers. There's a structure to follow. And there's a, a place in the paper where you have to see the scientific contribution of this paper is this. And the remainder of this paper is organized as follows and you put things in sections as they should be. And I, I didn't do it well. And I didn't insist on uh, the quality of uh, what I was submitting them. So the first few papers were rejected. Wow. And then I learned. They sent me a rejection letter. They said, well, uh, it's not good enough. Uh, it's not well presented. Uh, sorry, try something else. Try next time. And after a while, you know, when you're being hit on the fingers, you start thinking that, well, uh, they must be right. I must be wrong. I must improve. And I did. I did. Uh, my first papers, even those that were accepted, were not my best one. But with time, it's a skill. With time, you learn. And you become better. And I've had some good advice from people throughout my career. And I've improved. Yeah, we'll certainly talk about that shortly. Uh, but before uh, entering into those uh, the details about scientific writing and so on, um, I, I would like to talk about Cyril and Gerard. You have been involved with uh, uh, both for several decades. Uh, can you briefly comment about their origins and scope? Yeah, uh, the Cyril. Uh, before it was called the CIRED, it was a center of research uh, for transportation, on transportation. And it CRT. was created. Yeah, right? It was, CRT. It was on a CRT. CRT. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it was created in 1971 out of a grant from the Ford Foundation. And the Ford Foundation wanted to create uh, four research centers on transportation in Canada. One in Montreal at the uh, University de Montréal, one at Queen's University in Ontario, one at the University of Toronto, and one at the University of British Columbia. And uh, the only one that survived a fair amount of time was the CRT. 
And they came with the money. They went to see the rector of the university. And he said, look, rector, we have some money to give you if you open a center in transportation. And the rector said, yes, uh, no problem. No. He took the money. <laughs> they said, now let's think about what the center would look like. And they found some people in the university who were interested in transportation. I mean, in all universities of the world, you'll find a few people who are interested in transportation. So they put these people together and they said, would you like to start a center? And it worked. So at the beginning, there were just a few people in that center. Uh, it started with uh, two or three professors and a secretary. And it grew and grew and grew and, and they attracted students and they attracted money and so on and so forth. So that's how the Cyril started. The Girard um, was created in 1979. Uh, I was part of a team that was applying for a Quebec grant in research. And um, we thought that our team would have more chance of getting the grant if we called ourselves a center. So we created the Girard out of the idea of applying for a grant. So we created the, the center just for the purpose of getting the <laughs> grant, but it's, it, it lasted, it lasted. There were six of us in those days in, in that team. And um, with time, uh, again, this thing grew in parallel with the CRT. Yeah. So uh, what about your main scientific contributions? Uh, I know you can spend days talking about that, but uh, what are the ones that you feel uh, most proud of? I must say that um, my uh, most important contribution to uh, operations research lies in the field of uh, vehicle routing. I think that's what I'm known for. That's how I started to. That's one of my uh, first pieces of research was uh, the vehicle routing problem. I was trying to apply the traveling salesman methodology to the vehicle routing problem. Uh, today it looks very obvious, but um, nobody had done it before. Nobody had uh, developed sub two dimension constraints uh, that applied. Uh, well, for the vehicle routing problem and so on. So uh, I did that with my student. And uh, we developed the first branch and cut algorithm for the vehicle routing problem. And that appeared in two papers, the most important of which is uh, the one published in uh, Operations Research in 1985. And then together with that, uh, we did some related work, like uh, extending comb inequalities to the vehicle routing problem, uh, developing other versions of the vehicle routing problem. And again, today, it's, it's boring, you know. I mean, uh, when I see a paper solving yet another variant of the vehicle routing problem, I feel sad, you know, I say, oh, don't you have anything else to do in your life? It's, it's all been done. It's, we know about it. There's nothing new. There's nothing to see. But in those days, uh, creating these variants attracted a lot of attention. And some of these variants are not so trivial and are real. They, they, they correspond to real problems. So that's part of my contribution. Then I did some work maybe not in that order, but at some point on uh, stochastic vehicle routing problems, that's quite another level. And uh, with François Louveau, we developed the integral shape algorithm, which is an extension of Bender's decomposition yep. to st some classes of stochastic programs. And François Louveau was an expert in stochastic programming. I was not. So one day I came to him with a methodology to solve stochastic vehicle routing problems, stochastic demands with cuts and so on. And uh, he said, what you're doing is Bender's decomposition, my friend. Ah, oh, I didn't know that. And he said, we can uh, make that more general. 
So we published that in all our letters, and that's been used and extended and improved and quoted. So I think this is a major contribution, but I don't think I could have come up with the conceptual framework, the theoretical conceptual framework by myself. It's François Duvaux who managed all that. I, I had the idea, I knew the mechanism, but I could not have written a paper about it apart from writing just a, an algorithm. Then I did a lot of work on um, many location problems. So location and routing are quite complementary. I did a lot of applications in location, including um, things that many people, most people don't do, location of networks, location of metro lines. And I've worked at, I still do it, well, I don't do it today, but I've done it until uh, five years ago. Mm -hmm. uh, I've worked a lot on the best way to design metro lines, uh, maybe for 20 years, with people in Spain, one Antonio Mesa, for example, and we've become quite famous out of this. Uh, I worked on districting problems. Uh, these are ways to partition a territory into smaller units for all kinds of purposes. I've worked on that. Uh, with uh, my colleagues at the Mulder University College. We've worked on many applications in the offshore oil and gas industry, uh, one of which is how to um, schedule um, helicopter flights to bring people to the oil platforms, mm -hmm. knowing that uh, there's a high rate of accident in helicopters. It's one of the most dangerous transportation modes in existence. And about half the accidents occur at um, takeoffs and landings. So how do you how do you plan that to optimize or to minimize the risk of accident? Can you minimize the number of takeoffs and landing? Can you uh, organize things so that uh, people spend less time on the helicopters. You see, because they don't visit only one platform at a time, they visit many platforms. So can you optimize the, the risk? Can you minimize the risk? And um, you have to take into account the fact that in these helicopters, there are some passengers, these are workers who go to the platforms, and there's the pilot. But the pilot spends his life in the helicopter and the other people spend little time. So you have to balance the risk of the pilot and the risk of the passengers. So that's one of the things we did in, uh, in Malta. Uh, it's full of things I did. I, I don't know how much you want to hear about uh, all the projects I've worked on, but sometimes there are some that come to your mind and you like them. Some are quite fancy. Yeah, uh, I know you have done some work on humanitarian logistics as well. That's more recent, yes. Um, I had a student, Marie Vrancourt, who is now my uh, uh, work colleague. And when she was doing her PhD, uh, she did some humanitarian work in um, Kenya to locate uh, food distribution centers. So it's a location problem, but within the context of humanitarian logistics. And when you put humanitarian logistics, all kinds of a uh, bizarre factors uh, arrive. Uh, for example, uh, if you're in Kenya, uh, people have to walk to these distribution centers and it's not just uh, 50 meters. Sometimes it's uh, uh, five, 10 kilometers they have to walk. So you have to take that into account. Uh, how do you optimize these things? And later she um, did a career mostly based around humanitarian logistics. And she introduced me to many projects. The most recent one is um, restoring the water distribution system in Nepal following the two earthquakes they had in 2015. So the whole system was destroyed and you had to locate water taps in the villages. And of course, connect these water taps together to water sources so that uh, the water taps would cover the population correctly. 
and uh, the connections between the water taps would be done optimally for so standard forest in the FHA. So that was a good project. We won a prize for that. It was published in uh, CNOR in 2022. Yeah, these are all excellent uh, applications, contributions. As I said, we could be talking about that for a long time, but uh, this is just a good sample of uh, the fantastic sample. work you've done over the last 50 years. Uh, exactly. Yeah, so Joubert, uh, writing scientific papers is an art. Uh, and you are its ultimate master, at least in my opinion. Uh, can you describe the Joubert Laporte's method of crafting an academic article and its evolution over the years? Yeah, um, I often give um, talks about that. And um, I always start by telling people, look, if you want to write a paper and succeed, the main thing is to have some good material. Uh, if you have uh, poor, mat poor quality material, a poor idea, uh, you can uh, decorate it with all kinds of things, but uh, in the end it won't work. So you need something strong. But even if you have something good, a, a little bit like I, when I had my, uh, did my thesis and I failed in publishing papers, I had some good material, I think but I didn't sell it well, then you have to sell it intelligently. So what do you have to do? I could talk uh, an hour on that with you, maybe in a different uh, interview. Mm -hmm. But essentially, you have to um, sell your idea. You have to get a right structure for your paper. You have to introduce a topic intelligently. Everything has to be done well. You have to do a literature review, but not just quoting papers at random. Uh, it has to be geared towards selling your paper. There's a purpose to a literature review. And I referee so many papers, and I see literature reviews that have two, three pages, and uh, this guy did that, this guy did that, this guy did that. Yes, but what are we learning exactly? How is that telling the reader that what you're doing is going to be well integrated with this? Then you have to write a model. Well, you can use any letters you want in your model, my friend, but uh, there are better letters than others. And I've seen so many people write models in real time. You know, you sit next to them and they say, okay, let's call this X. And let's call this Y. Uh, now I need a new letter. I've already used X and Y. Let's call that W. And people keep adding letters to their story and at the end, it's a mess. One little advice I give people is plan your notation. Before you write the model, think, think. What is going to be a name for a variable? What is going to be a name for a constant, for a matrix, for a set, and so on and so forth? You have to take things that are natural, mnemonic, uh, if you have a routing paper, you call your variables XIJ. You don't call them AIJ. Because if it's AIJ, well, uh, the reader doesn't know it's a variable and so on and so forth. So you have to write a model in a clear and neat way. And then you have to describe your algorithm, your heuristic, with proper introduction, proper steps, uh, and so on and so forth. There are ways to present computational results. Uh, I see so many papers with lots of tables, lots of columns, but it, they're discussed. So what's the point in having a table with 30 columns if you don't talk about them ever? So you have to be purpose purposeful. You have to be careful. And you have to be careful with details, like the references. Uh, today I see paper, I refer many papers, and I see papers where the authors take their references from Big BibTech. And BibTech, I think it comes from Google Scholar. Anyway, they take references from banks. They've never seen them. They've never opened the paper. They've never printed the paper, like I did when I was a student. And they cite these things. And there are errors in these references. I'm very sorry. There are errors in BibTech. There are errors in Google Scholar. 
but people don't check these things. And it breaks my heart, it breaks my heart to see these errors and to think that people are quoting papers that they have never seen. And sometimes they quote them wrongly. They say, if you read this paper, you'll find this. No, 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 no. It's like, you know, a guy in 1964 applied taboo search for this. I'm sorry, in 1964, there was no taboo search. Yeah. And I see these things every day. So I would not talk too much about paper writing in the sense that I could go on and on for hours. It's one of my favorite topics. Yeah, yeah. But I would like, uh, I'd like you to share also your very peculiar way of uh, writing papers, especially, you know, during the 80s and 90s, you know. Well, let's put it this way. Um, you call that peculiar, <laughs> but to me, it's the um, opposite. Uh, when I write a paper, I write it by hand <laughs> because I've always been brought up to write by hand. Uh, when I was at primary school, we wrote by hand. And when I was doing my PhD, I wrote everything by hand, by the way. And the secretary typed the thesis. And uh, for a while, we didn't have word processors. And even when we started having them, they were not all good at the beginning. And I'm always a late um, player, you know. When the new technology comes, I'm one of the last people on earth to adopt it. So I've kept writing papers by hand all my life. Quite recently, I've made an effort to uh, at least give my secretary a written text. So I can now open a Word file and write a Word document, which is quite recent in my life. And I give that to my secretary. And I write the uh, mathematics by hand because uh, doing mathematics with word is awful but i don't know latex but i tell her look uh, put that in latex uh, i don't like stuff mm -hmm. in word so she does that and it works it works as long as it works i'm happy and once the paper is written i will revise it uh, 20 times you know yeah i've been through uh, the process so i know <laughs> yeah i've used many uh, red pens in my life yeah i still do today because if you want to have a good paper it has to be almost perfect, at least for the presentation. Yeah. So during the 80s, uh, uh, Michel Chandreau was telling me that you did a lot of uh, cut and paste, but by literally cutting parts of the paper and pasting. That, that's them. why it's called cut and paste. You cut with scissors and you paste with scotch tape. And, um, you know, it's a pity that when you spent um, several seconds writing a a five line paragraph, you don't have to lose it. You don't have to throw it away. If you want to use it somewhere else, you cut it and you stick it somewhere else in the paper so you don't waste your time. So sometimes my papers had several layers of, of paper and uh, the, they were heavy, you know, but uh, I don't do it like that anymore. Mm -hmm. But I've done that for a long, long time. Yeah, it's very interesting. Uh, so I should bet you have certainly influenced many people, including myself, <laughs> when it comes to uh, writing scientific papers and grant applications. But who are your main influences in that regard? I would say that I've had two people maybe who have influenced me in writing. Maybe they don't know it. Uh, Silvano Martello from the University of Bologna. Uh, he's a guy who cares a lot about writing. Uh, you should also sit next to him and write paper because he's a bit like me, at least in the days when I worked with him. He wrote with a lead pencil, not a pen, a lead pencil and a little eraser, you know, these uh, brown things. And he would um, write and erase a little bit and do <laughs> like this <laughs> and he would continue <laughs> and he was very careful and he cared a lot about notation it's he's the guy who taught me how to write with a neat notation and i also learned from a consultant 
Um, one day we were writing a grant, a major grant application for many million dollars. And uh, it, it was a tough process. We decided to hire a consultant in um, grant writing. There are such people. So I worked with him, it was called Richard Lake. And uh, this guy told me how to present uh, data and tables and figures in a document and how to break things into paragraphs. And he cared a lot about the physical look of the application. Because the people who read these grant applications, they have uh, piles of them to read. They don't like reading that. It's boring to read grant applications, I tell you. So you have to do something that will make them happier. So if the layout of your grant application is pleasant, if there are tables at the right places, pictures, maps, graphs, figures, and when you, when you do a graph, you have to label the, the two axes very carefully. You have to use the right uh, size, the right colors, and so on and so far. It makes all the difference. You don't win a grant application just by writing good text. It's important what you need to, have, to care about the appearance, at least. Anyway, I learned from these two people. And there's Erhan Erkut, who is a professor at MEF University in um, Istanbul. And he taught me how to write tables, especially for uh, presentations and conferences. When people show their slides in a conference, most of the time, they come with a table that's too dense, especially in a conference, in a presentation. People will not want to see all your little numbers. They want to see the main columns, the main things. So keep your tables neat and sparse and clear. And that also applies to writing papers. But he taught that to me in the context of teaching and presenting at conferences. So you learn from many people and you listen. I like these things, so I listen. I take things from many people. And I also read books about scientific writing. Mm -hmm. There are quite a few around and I read them. You don't agree with everything, but you take ideas from many sources. Wow. Juba, you have collaborated with more than 425 co-authors in your career, literally from A to Z, and I'm very proud to be one of them <laughs> for two occasions. Uh, how do you feel about that? Do you see yourself as the Poetish of OR? How do I feel? Um, the you, the you was tough to find. <laughs> <laughs> well, it, I, what I feel is this. Um, I enjoy working with people. I enjoy uh, doing research with people, writing papers with people. Um, and in a way, I help them a lot, writing papers. They, they're appreciative, I think. And I've had many students, and I care a lot that my um, students uh, should write good papers. And I spend a lot of time uh, with my students, with my former students, postdocs and so on. So I end up having, uh, no, I've had, uh, I think, close to 100 graduate students and about 30 postdocs in my life, plus many, 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 many collaborators throughout the world. Uh, so that adds up. And I enjoy, I enjoy the social um, aspect of it. I enjoy the, the process. I enjoy the process of collaborating with people. It's, it's a source of happiness. Some people don't like writing papers. They don't like to do that sort of thing. I like to sit next to someone or exchange uh, various versions of a paper with someone, uh, discuss things and so on. And uh, out of all these uh, co-authors, uh, I think mo most 98% of them have been uh, a source of 99%, a source of happiness. Uh, maybe there are 
four or five people, I would say, well, I wouldn't try to work with these people anymore, but it's an exception. Uh, it's a sort of happiness. Mm -hmm. uh, are you addicted to writing papers? I mean, uh, can you see yourself without doing that? No. <laughs> <laughs> I retired um, three years ago, and I still do it. I never stopped. And I don't see myself stopping doing that because it's an activity I'm good at, I enjoy, and um, I can still do it uh, in the correct way. So as long as I'm fine, that I'm uh, in good health, in good spirits, I don't see myself uh, stopping that. And to me, writing papers in my retirement, um, it means that I keep in touch with my colleagues. And that is also important to keep uh, a scientific social life because uh, university life is not working alone in your office. It's being in touch with people. It's knowing people. And uh, my, my collaborators are my friends. And my leisure time is also my work. It's all mixed up, you know. Uh -huh. I don't have a set of uh, university colleagues and a set of friends and uh, leisure time and working time. It's all mixed up in my mind. And uh, I want to keep it that way. I keep my contacts. Right. So I don't think I'll stop. I don't think I'll ever stop. Maybe I'll slow down. Uh -huh. uh, one reason why I slow down is I don't, I don't have students anymore. And um, well, uh, when you have students, uh, they do a lot of the work mm -hmm. and uh, you get more papers. Mm -hmm. uh, when you don't have students, you're more limited. Uh -huh. But still, yeah. I'm, I'm still useful. Yeah, I'm happy to hear that you're still doing research. Yeah. Right. Yeah, I know we uh, already discussed about uh, how do you uh, see a paper uh, as an author and uh, you gave so many precious and valuable uh, tips, uh, especially to youngsters. But I wonder, how do you evaluate a paper as a reviewer and as an editor? Yeah, I think that um, it's the same process. And I would say it's like Russian dolls. You start from the outside and you go to the inside. The inside is the, the, the core of the paper, it's the, the material. But I'm, I'm a bit funny. When I read a paper, I cannot go to the core without being happy with the outside, with the style, with the presentation. I'm made like that. Some people can take a paper that's very poorly written and go to the main idea and be happy with that. I don't think that way. I, I, it's funny. Uh, it's like when you buy a house, you look at the outside. If you don't like the color of the brick, you won't ring the bell to go inside. Uh, it's the same thing. So when I read the paper, I start with the outside, the appearance, the look, starting with the front page, uh, starting with the names of the authors. You'll be surprised to know that uh, many papers are, have mistakes in the names of the authors because one of the co-authors writes it and he doesn't know exactly how to spell the name of his friends. And um, sometimes the first page looks messy. It's uh, all in the five lines at the beginning. Then I look at the references. I told you earlier, mm -hmm. um, there are many, 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 many mistakes in references. And if I find too many mistakes in the references, I start the bad feeling. I say, well, these people are sloppy. And when you're sloppy in the references, you're sloppy elsewhere. You probably slip in your code. <laughs> and as you know, when we uh, check a heuristic, we don't have the code. I'm not going to go in the code, you know. You have to trust the authors. You have mm -hmm. to trust that they've been careful. But if they're not careful in the references, maybe they're not careful in their coding. Maybe there's are mistakes there. Then I look at the structure of the paper. It's a paper is all should have about the same structure all the time. It's an introduction, a literature review, a model, an algorithm, results, conclusion, that's fine. I check these things. Then I check what is the problem they're talking about. And that should be in the introduction. 
And sometimes you don't know what the problem is until page nine. And then you say, what is the problem? Can I see the problem that's being solved? And is this problem interesting? Sometimes the problem is not interesting. It's been done or it's boring. It's a stupid extension or it's a problem that makes no sense. It's unbelievable to see problems that don't make sense. Then I said, what is the research question? What are they trying to do? And then I do the normal things. I check the literature review. And does the literature review bring you to uh, the lead to the call of the paper? Or is it a random set of papers that people quote without a purpose? Do people know their literature? Because I know the literature, I tell you. I know what are the main papers in many, many, many fields. And when I see that they only quote secondary papers, I say, they, they didn't read enough. They don't know. And you make an impression, and this impression develops most of the times downwards, very badly in most papers I refer you, unfortunately. And then I told you about the models. Uh, mistakes, not just in the notation, mistakes in some constraints. I don't check everything in every model I see, but sometimes I do. Sometimes I doesn't feel right, this model. Then I start r looking at the constraints and I find constraints that make no sense. Two constraints that contradict each other, redundant constraints. Um, I read a paper recently where the congestion level on the road was a decision variable. I said, that makes no sense. And that sort of stuff. And then I don't read the heuristic immediately. I go to the results. Because if the results are not good, that's the end of it, you know. And uh, if the results are good, well, then I say, okay, it could be a good heuristic. Uh, do they really prove it? And so on and so forth. So I go back and forth like that. And uh, I refer you about one paper a week. It's more than most people. Absolutely. I spend a lot of time refereeing papers. And uh, the rejection rate of most journals is about 80 to 90%. And that's close to my own rejection rate, too. Unfortunately, uh, many papers are rejected. Sometimes they're rejected and they come back in another journal without making changes. And that annoys me like crazy, you know. Uh -huh. We have wasted a lot of time checking these papers. People should care a bit more. Mm -hmm. And maybe there's too much pressure in uh, many places to publish quick and fast, and the people submit things that don't make sense. It's annoying. It's mm -hmm. annoying. And, and as an editor, uh, what is your... Well, as an editor, it's the same process at a higher level. First of all, as an editor, I do a lot of desk rejects, which means that I do the same thing as a referee. Because before sending papers to referees, I read them. Why? Because I don't like to send garbage to referees. It's a waste of time for them. And if I take a paper that looks bad and I send it to two or three referees, then I'm going to have to chase these referees in the future. It's going to take me a lot of time. I have to, I would have to handle reports that are contradictory. I would have to spend a lot more time than if I desk rejected myself in one evening. So I do a lot of desk rejects. When I don't know the topic enough to make a judgment, or when I think the paper looks reasonably good, I said that, that could be good. Then I have to find referees. I try to take referees I know, not all the time. But I know many people. It's one advantage of having a good network if you're an editor. If you've worked with uh, 425 co-authors, 
you have a big network. So I can use these people quite often. I know how they think. I know their judgment. So it tells me a lot. Because if you send a paper to a person you've never seen, uh, you have to judge the, the quality of the, the response. You have to make a judgment on the referee. It's part of it too. So I try to find good referees. And the, normally, normally there's a unanimity or quasi-unanimity on the verdicts. Sometimes not. And if it's not the case, I spend more time reading the paper myself. I make my own judgment and I write a letter. That's it. It's either rejected or major revision. Okay. I'm sure you take if it's major, mm -hmm. Yeah, if it's major revision, it means one thing. I like the paper a lot. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it, it, for sure you take um, a, a lot of care and you put a lot of work in the process. I, and I bet more than most people. Um, so, Joubert, uh, you won so many prizes and awards. Do you have any favorites? Well, I think the most important one is the Order of Canada. This is rare. The Killam Prize in Canada is quite prestigious. And last year I won the um, Euro Gold Medal. And that is quite a prestigious award, uh, certainly in Europe, but even worldwide. And um, I'm not a European. But they gave it to me anyway because uh, they consider that I've uh, contributed to uh, the development of war in Europe. And I was uh, very, very happy with this. Uh, when I got this news, uh, that made my, not just my day, made uh, many days of happiness. <laughs> Fantastic. So, Joubert, uh, do you have any regrets in your life? Maybe, apart from not having studied music. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe there's one thing lacking in, uh, in me. It's formal knowledge of many things in um, operations research. You see, my um, MSc studies had coursework, but very basic coursework, you know, are very the elementary things. I never had um, formal training in mathematical programming. At London School of Economics, there were no there were no courses, so nobody taught me in a formal way. I level linear programming. I level linear algebra. Uh, Bender's decomposition. Uh, any of these uh, Lagrangian relaxation. I learned that. Of course, I know what these things are. But I never learned them formally, count generation. I never learned that formally. And I think I would have been stronger if I had had a more formal um, training in the basics of war. I'm not talking about uh, heuristics and that sort of stuff. Uh, that's, uh, anyway, you don't need to learn that uh, in, a, in a formal course. But uh, there's no theory behind this. But I would have liked to have a stronger formal training in the basic things. And that could be a regret. But that was it's somewhat beyond your control, right? It was beyond my control. It's a result of the choices I made. Mm -hmm. If I had gone to Stanford or MIT instead of London School of Economics, I would have been forced to take these high-level courses. Ah. But in England, even today, there's not much emphasis on formal learning at the PhD level. There's more than there was in my days. But uh, it's much less than what you get in the United States. At the same time, I did a thesis that was more deep and more mature than many of the theses I see in the United States. So it's a balance. It's a balance. When you learn by yourself, uh, you learn in a less structured way, but uh, maybe when you understand, it stays longer. Right. Well, Joubert, uh, 
this is probably uh, one of the best conversations that I've ever had in my entire life. So I cannot thank you enough. I'm super grateful for your time. Thank you so much. Merci beaucoup. Merci. Well, I thank you very much for having hosted me. I'm quite proud to be part of this uh, series of uh, conversations with uh, my colleagues. And uh, I'd be happy to see the, the result one day. <laughs> yeah, I mean, uh, it, it's a, it has been fantastic. Uh, you know that if you want to visit Brazil, uh, the doors are, uh, are always open. Uh, we met here in Brazil in 2010. Uh, then uh, I met you again in 2011. Then more recently in 2019 at Verolog in Spain. So, I mean, uh, every, every meeting we had, I learned a lot from you. And... I'm super grateful you have influenced my uh, career, um, maybe in more ways than you think, uh, especially when it comes to writing. Uh, at the beginning of my career, I, you know, was I was looking for uh, you know, references, and you are, uh, I would say, the reference in, in routing for sure. And uh, I mean, I, I can, you know, spend hours thanking you for how many, in how many ways you have influenced me. So. I think that extends to many people that are listening, many of your students, many people of our community. We owe you a lot, you bet. You were a true legend. And once again, thank you, thank you very much. You're so kind. Thank you. Yeah. So uh, let's hope to meet soon, one of these days, and take care. Well, maybe we should um, continue with Maria doing something else. <laughs> Who knows? Yeah. Take care uh, and stay uh, healthy. And I hope to read some of your papers uh, in the years to come okay okay thank you bye ciao bye